thanks be unto God who gives us the victory every single day of our life. And we bless him and honor him for the privilege that we even have just to, just to gather around his word. As you know, I'm teaching a series here in the book of James, chapter 1, and uh, we'll be beginning in verse 12 in this session. Notice here the word of the Lord. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it, brings, uh, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my bro uh, beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And I'm talking in this session about triumph over temptation. Triumph over temptation. Now, here, here's the truth. Everyone faces temptation. No matter how old you are or how young, no matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're educated or uneducated, whether you're spiritual or carnal, whether you're filled with the Holy Ghost or not, everybody, without exception, faces temptations. Now, temptation may be different based on the person. Everybody has a different appeal. For some people, you know, sweets are a real temptation to them. Other people, sweets are not their problem. Bread is their problem. And for other folks, it may be carbohydrates, it may be spaghetti, it may be something else, you know. And we don't all have the same temptations. There are different things that tempt different people, but everybody deals with temptation. You don't get too spiritual to be tempted. I mean, even some of the old church mothers with long skirts down to the floor. I mean, they, they have their own temptations in their own way. Now, now here's the deal. God does not want us to yield to temptation. He does not want us to yield to temptation, but neither does he spare us of the experience of temptation. You know, God could keep us from ever being tempted, but he does not spare us from that experience of being tempted. Remember that Jesus himself was tempted of the devil for 40 days after being led of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, Luke chapter 4. And so maybe that's why Jesus taught us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Because Jesus himself went through temptation. Now, if Jesus went through temptation, and if he is our example, we know that we're going to deal with it. It's not a matter of if temptation is ever going to come to you. The question is, how are you going to respond when temptation comes your way? The question is, how do you remain strong to resist temptation? How do you remain strong to resist temptation? That's the question. You see, God generally tests us with trials, but the devil tempts us with temptation. He tempts us with temptation. And trust me, the devil knows your weakness. He's not going to tempt you with something that you have no appetite for. He knows how you like him. If you like him tall, he knows that. If you like him built, he knows. If you like him with pretty hair, he, he knows that. I mean, there's some people, if they have a certain kind of smile, it just melts them down, you know. It's just, just certain features. He knows when he's going to send an agent to tempt you, he's going to send one that's got the kind of look and the sound that really makes you weak at the knees. 
You know, there are that, that, that some brothers, you know, and, uh, you know, there's some, a certain woman will come on to them and in the air like they're all strong. It's just that she's not that type. And that's not a temptation. Some woman will be strong against, you know, this man came rolling up on me trying to ask him, hey, hey, can I holler at you? Maybe if he looked differently, she might have let him holler a little bit, at least tell a few little things and sort of blush a little bit, you know, just, you know, it, it depends on who it is as to whether it's a temptation or not. So we have to be very, very aware of that. Now, trials are generally external issues and events, and temptations are generally internal struggles. Temptations are oftentimes in, uh, internal because every temptation, in all honesty, is a temptation that is presented to the mind. It is presented to the mind. It's an internal struggle. And when our circumstances are difficult, we may find ourselves complaining against God, murmuring against God. You have to be very careful. Whenever your circumstances are, are difficult, we may find ourselves complaining or murmuring against God questioning his love for us you get in a in a hard time and you start questioning does god really love me and if he did love me why am i going through this uh you might start uh believing that he is angry with us you know because you're going through a hard time maybe god's mad at me no uh you, you might you, you're having a, a hard time and you might find yourself resisting his will resisting his will because sometimes the will of God is not always the easy road it is not always the easy road but it is at this point when you feel like things are difficult for you that Satan provides an opportunity to escape the difficulty he always provides an opportunity you know we talk about how God will provide a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it well the devil knows how when you get in a situation that is a trial how to give you an easy way out of that situation the opportunity is a temptation this opportunity is a temptation and the Bible is full of examples of this of this truth Abraham he arrived in Canaan and he discovered that there was a famine there uh, he wasn't able to care for his flocks and his herds. This was a, a, a trial. It was an opportunity for him to prove God. But Abraham turned it into a temptation, and he went down to Egypt. He took an easy way out. And God had to chasten Abraham and to bring him back to a place of obedience and blessing. It's very interesting. Now, if we are to mature, we must face testing and temptation if we're going to mature testing and temptation when you grow up you're going to be presented with an opportunity to even either respond in an immature fashion like a child or to to deal with it like a man or like a woman it's a part of the maturation process now here are a few things that we must consider if we are to triumph over temptation if you want to know what's going to happen if, if I get ready to be to be tempted how do I triumph over temptation? How do I triumph over temptation? Here's number one. Consider God's judgment. Consider God's judgment. Verse 13 through 16 talks about that. Consider God's judgment. Consider God's judgment. If, if you yield to the, to the temptation, God's going to judge you. God's going to judge you. This, honestly, is about the fear of the Lord that helps to restrain us from evil. To know that on the other side of every temptation is a judgment of God. You have to think about that before you get into it, that God's going to judge me for breaking his law. God's going to judge me for doing wrong. God's going to judge me for cheating. Think about the consequences of yielding to temptation. Because whenever you get a temptation, you never think about the consequences. The devil never shows you the consequences of the temptation. He only shows you somebody that's fine and good looking. He does not show you that once you get in wrapped up with this psycho and they start stalking you. I mean, he does not show you all of their, the stuff, you know, that, that you didn't realize that they were on their medication when you met them. Uh, you know, he didn't, he, I mean, he showed you them pulling up in this nice car, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. And, and he didn't show you that they were maxed to the hilt in debt. 
that it wasn't nearly as good as what it actually was. And then they, they start telling you, you know what, I, I, I left my wallet and then, you know, can, can, can you let me hold? And, and you realize that this, this was a trick. This, this was a trick. So he never shows you the consequences. So consider God's judgment and think about the consequences of yielding to temptation. There's always a consequence. Now realize this, this, that the torment of the temptation to sin is nothing to compare with the torment of the consequences of sin. Yes, I know you have to like sweat bullets sometimes when you're under temptation, particularly when your body hormones are acting up on you. And you, you are weaker at some times than you are at other times. And yeah, it is torment. It is just murder, murder on you. You're just sweating bullets. There is a torment of a temptation to sin, but the torment of the temptation to sin is nothing to compare with the torment of the consequences of sin. So here is a woman, she, she feels that her body is in heat. She's feeling her hormones working on the inside of her, making her really want to, to be sexually active. And there's a torment of dealing with all of these hormones that are influencing her feelings. So that's the torment or the temptation to sin. Now, after she sleeps with Job, she's no longer dealing with the torment of the temptation to sin. Now she's dealing with the torment of the consequences of sin. Did this man give me a disease? Am I now pregnant? Now, now she's dealing, uh, you, you understand what I mean? So that's why I said that the, the torment of the temptation to sin is, is, is nothing to compare with the torment of the consequences of sin. Men have the same issue. Did I get an infection from her? Did I get her pregnant? See, so uh, while, while they're in heat, uh, they're, they're under the pressure of the torment of the temptation to sin, but after the act, they're dealing now with the torment of the consequences of sin. The consequences of sin. So I'm just telling you, the torment of the temptation to sin is nothing to compare with the torment of the consequences of sin. Now, here's the deal. You have the right, the total right, to choose your actions, but you have no right to choose the consequences. The consequences are built into the act itself. It's built into the act itself. That if you eat a whole lot of this stuff, the consequence is built into it that it's going to give you indigestion. It's built into it. It's not that God punishes you. God knew that there was a problem in it. He knew it was going to give you gas, so he said, listen, don't fool with that. But you don't listen. And you say it's good and I like it. And now your stomach is hurting. Now you're all bloated. Now you're full of gas. <laughs> and saying what you shouldn't have eaten. But the only reason that we ate it is because we know that it's good because we like it. And so we were tempted when somebody offered it to us and we gave in to the temptation. Now we're dealing with the torment of the consequences of it. All bloated and say, mm, oh Lord, I ain't going to sleep good tonight. Mm. And now, now you've got acid reflux. And you're sitting up in the bed, you know, now regretting, dealing with the consequences. You have the right to choose your actions, but you have no right to choose the consequences. James essentially says here, look ahead and see where sin ends up, death. And he said, listen, don't blame God for the temptation because God is too holy to be tempted and he is too loving to tempt others. Remember, God does test us, but he does not tempt us. The devil tempts. God tests. God tested Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, but God does not and cannot tempt us. Uh, but it is we who in turn, we, we are the ones who are able to turn occasions of testing into temptations. Now, I want you to get this. A temptation is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. That's all a temptation is. It is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. That's a, that's a temptation. An opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way, which is normally outside of the will of God. It's outside of the will of God. The opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. 
Now, if you get in dire straits and you need money to be able to pay your bills and buy food, the devil will give you an, a temptation to do something that is illegal, something that is immoral, or something that is illicit. He will give you a temptation to do something illegal, immoral, or illicit in order to get money. Now, you need money. And, and so the temptation is, is that I don't have the time to try to work and get this money legitimately, so he shows you a shortcut. He gives you an opportunity to accomplish a good thing. Paying your bills is a good thing. It's an opportunity to do a good thing in a bad way in a bad way, in an illicit way, in an immoral way, in an illegal way. So, I mean, getting money to feed your children is a good thing, but getting the money through prostituting your body or selling drugs or selling stolen merchandise, see, that's a temptation. If you ever have a person and they come up a little short and if they used to sell dope and if they used to sell stolen merchandise and if they used to prostitute, you get in financial straits and immediately the first thing that comes to your mind is to go back to the last thing that you knew how to do in order to get some quick easy money so you get the temptation to go back and to do this underhanded immoral illicit or illegal activity this is a temptation an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way outside of the will of god and that's what we end up end up dealing with we end up dealing with that. I mean, is it wrong to pass an examination? Absolutely not. But if you cheat in order to pass the examination, then you've sinned. You see, the temptation to cheat is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing, which is passing the test, but in a bad way. And the devil is always trying to give us a shortcut that ends up being the long road. Because he makes it look like a shortcut. If you do this, nobody's going to find out about it. There is the temptation to cheat, always to cheat, the temptation to get this in a quick fashion. But easy come, easy, easy go, easy go. The folks that live in these high immoral lifestyles, they make big money, but you find them five years down the road and, and ask them how much they've saved up of it. They've just, they've, they've lived and spent this money up. It's like it has a curse built into it. It's not designed to be uh, able to be accumulated when you've done it and worked hard for it the old-fashioned way and earned it legitimately and legally. You get it illegally, now you've got to deal with the torment of the consequences of sin. Every time you hear a siren, <laughs> you're scared because of the popo, you know, wondering, is uh, it's somebody after me now? You know, every, t every time, you know, you, you see a police car, you just drive it on, you slow down. Just subconsciously, because you, you don't even want to, just as a precaution, because you know, you know, so there are a wide variety of things that, that, that bring the consequences. And see, we think of sin as a, as a single act, but God sees sin as a process. Sin is a process. Adam committed one act of sin, and yet that one act of sin, it, 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 that, that one act that Adam did, it brought sin death and judgment on the whole human race it was a process though it was a process james describes this process here in james chapter 1 i want you to see the process here in james chapter 1 look at verse 14 but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires or lust and enticed desire is, is the first thing the process of sin has four stages. Stage one is desire, desire, desire. The serpent used desire to interest Eve. Did you know that the word lust means any kind of desire, not necessarily sexual passion? The word lust means any kind of desire. You can lust food. You can lust alcohol. It's not, we just, we, we hear the word lust and we immediately think that this is talking about sexual passion. Lust is any kind of desire. The normal desires of life are given to us by God. And they in and of themselves are not sinful. Because without these uh, natural desires, we would not be able to function. I mean, unless we uh, felt hunger and thirst, we would never eat and drink and then we'd die. Sex is a normal drive. And without it, the human race could not continue if everybody's going to be celibate. We'd all die off. I mean, it's, it's, it's true. 
see the problem comes in is when we want to satisfy these desires outside of the will of God when we want to satisfy it outside of the will of God remember a temptation is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way outside of the will of God and so we have to be very very careful about that I mean eating is normal gluttony is sin sleep is normal laziness is sin marriage is honorable in all in the bed undefiled but whoremongers and adulterers God's gonna judge Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 you see these fundamental desires of life they're like the steam in in the boiler that makes the machinery go you turn off the steam and you have no power and then you let the steam go its own way and then you have destruction the secret is constant control it's being able to control you know when you turn on something that has some power you got to control this thing you don't just turn fire on and just leave it unattended. You've got to control this thing. So these desires must be our servants and not our master. And this is what we do through Jesus Christ. So remember, there's a process of sin. Sin initiates a process in our life. Process number one is desire. He creates an unhealthy desire, an abnormal desire. Here's number two, deception. Deception. No temptation appears as temptation. It always seems more alluring than what it actually is. It's the greener grass, uh, you know, syndrome. You see somebody, and all you see is a good part. You don't see their flaws until you get up close. After, until after you've known them for a while. Then you start seeing uh, chinks in the armor. You know, Jesus uses, uh, James uses this word, drawn away, which carries the idea of baiting a trap drawn away baiting a trap that's what you do with with an animal that you're trying to catch in a snare and uh, the word entice you know that notice that in in verse 14 he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed this word enticed in the original greek means to bait a hook it means to bait a hook there's a deception there is something good that's always on the hook no fish would ever bite a naked hook on purpose. They always go after the bait. You cannot catch a fish with a hook if there is no bait. You've got to put a worm on it. The only reason that they bite the worm is because they don't see the hook. Let me just tell you, there's always a hook in it. There's always a hook in the meat. You have to be careful. He says you're drawn away and enticed. There's a trap that's set. They're trying to get something. They're looking for a baby daddy. <laughs> looking for a baby mama, I'm telling you, they're trying to get something. There's, there's a hook in it. There is a hook. You better believe that there is a hook. When you see a, a real temptation, that means it, it means to bait the hook. You see, the hunter and the, and the fisherman, they use bait uh, to attract and to catch their prey because no animal is going to deliberately step into a trap and no fish is going to just bite, uh, you know, a naked hook. So the idea is to hide the trap. You put some stuff over it, some foliage, some leaves, some grass over it to cover it so that it looks natural. And then they step into the trap and the trap snaps them. You're trying to catch a mouse, you put cheese on the trap so that they don't even see the trap. You want them to be focused on the cheese. And then they, they, they lose their head, get clamped down, smash their little, poor little neck, going after a piece of cheese. Now, if they saw that spring and that clamp back just waiting to come slamming down on them, they wouldn't go after that stuff. They're looking at the cheese. Can you imagine that when the devil shows you something good, you better take your time to stand back from that thing and look all around it because I'm telling you, there's something that's trying to break your neck, break your spirit. It may look good, but it is set up on something. You are being set up. You have to really realize we are not ignorant of his devices. Ignorant of his devices. When you go in ignorant of his device, you see something that looks good, and he tempts you unless you think that somebody has caught this and, and sent this food out for you like, like we put out cookies for Santa Claus. That is, I'm telling you, it's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. So the idea is to hide the trap, uh, you know, and, and the hook. And that's called deception. Deception. So temptation always carries with it some kind of a bait that appeals to natural desires the bait not only 
attracts us, but it also hides the fact that yielding to the desire is eventually going to bring sorrow and punishment. Uh, the bait itself is an exciting thing. And, and so you, you, you realize that when David looked on his neighbor's wife, he would never have committed adultery had he seen the tragic consequences, which was the death of their uh, son that he had by Bathsheba and, and the murder of, of his loyal soldier Uriah and then the violation that came to his own daughter Tamar as a result of his sin. Had he been able to see the consequences of what was in this trap, he never would have done it. The bait keeps us from seeing the consequence of sin because we're looking at the bait. Because the bait is all, you know, packaged up so nicely that it, you know, we may be like, man, wow. We, we are all overwhelmed by the, by the packaging of the bait. That we don't even see the, the clamps and the, and the hook that's behind this thing to get us ensnared and addicted and soul ties all wrapped up in our life. And now we sit up in the bed when we ought to be thinking about Jesus. And we sit up there thinking about some joke. I wonder why he hadn't called me. And this, you know, and you're dealing with all of this stuff because you didn't see the trap. Now your emotions are all wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up because something looked good to you. But not everything that looks good to you is good for you. So it starts with desire, and the desire leads you into a deception. Stage three of how sin works is it brings you into disobedience. Disobedience. Notice in, in verse 15, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. It gives birth to sin. Sin is disobedience, willful disobedience against the will of God. And so we've now moved from the emotions, which is the desire, and the intellect, which is deception that comes to that, now to the will, to the will. Sin is willful rebellion against the known will of God. And so James now changes the picture from hunting and fishing to the birth of a baby because desire conceives a method for taking the bait. And uh, the will approves and then acts, and then the result is sin. And so whether you feel it or not, you're hooked and trapped. And uh, mature Christian living is, is a matter of the will. Mature Christian living. It is a matter of the will, not feelings. Children operate by their feelings. But mature people operate on the basis of their will because it is right no matter how they feel. Thank you.